Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. promise that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And we thank you for all those in this room whom Ted's prayer spoke to, that better days are ahead. Lord, we trust you. You are the living Lord. We thank you that you do know the plans you have for us, that they are plans for good and not for evil, plans for blessing and not for calamity, plans with a future and plans with a hope. And we thank you that those plans rest in those hands that went to the cross for us the hands of Jesus, and we just love you so much, Lord. We pray that you will bless your word this morning, that you would speak to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We've been in a, a series. This is the third week of that series called The Most Important Week in History. And we've approached that series uh, from the perspective that God put so much preparation into what happened in these events that we remember from Palm Sunday when Jesus entered into Jerusalem through the cross, through the resurrection, that for thousands of years he had been preparing the world for these events. And it all came to this great conclusion uh, of so many themes of the Bible that had come together that had been told about Jesus and what would happen when he came. And so we're here today on part three of that series, The Most Important Week in History. And of course, today we're gonna to be talking about the resurrection. And uh, th there's no one in all of history that calmly proclaimed that his history would be different than the history of everyone else who died. He, he calmly proclaimed from the beginning of mankind until the time of Jesus, there had no one, at least in their right mind, who had calmly proclaimed that of his own power after he had died, he would rise again from the dead. Because it's an impossibility in the natural order of things. It's not even possible. Not long after death, our bodies begin to secrete something on a cellular level that destroys the billions of cells in our body. It, it destroys their ability to sustain life. And once that has happened, without a miracle, those cells can never sustain life again. Now, some people in the Bible were brought back to dead, from the dead, by Jesus through a miracle. But the resurrection of Jesus, and they died again, by the way. They died again, but Christ never died again. But Jesus, nobody brought him back but himself. It was his own power as God that enabled him to have this miracle of resurrection take place within his body, where these billions of cells got healed, and his, they were able to sustain life, and he was transformed. So this is, actually, these events are the most important events in history. My uh, remote isn't working here, but I'm just going to continue to move along. And it says in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 47, He, Jesus, said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. He's saying the pages of the Old Testament, certainly they served many purposes, but throughout all those additional purposes that were served in the Old Testament writings, there was one thing that was being pointed towards throughout it all, that thus it was written 
underneath it all, underlying everything else, that Christ, the Messiah, would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Those are the words of Jesus himself. And when we think about, we've, we've looked at several of these ways throughout the Old Testament that God highlighted what would happen when Jesus came. On Good Friday, we looked at the Passover, and the, on Palm Sunday, we looked at just sort of an overview of, of what the Bible teaches about this. But there was one thing that, that sort of really is appropriate to talk about on Easter Sunday from those Old Testament analogies, and it comes from the book of Leviticus in chapter 16. And I'm, I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about what happened in that passage. You're welcome to get your Bible and to check it out yourself. But Leviticus chapter 16 is the, the details of the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, it was the one time in the calendar year when the high priest took the blood of the sacrifice and entered into the immediate presence of God in the Holy of Holies, carrying the blood of the sacrifice. And prior to that, certain other things had to happen. Prior to that, this high priest, whom everyone could recognize because he wore these garments of glory and beauty, he had these gemstones on his chest, he had all these things that separated him apart from everyone else. No one else looked like him. No one else dressed like him. And when people saw him, he was easily recognizable as the high priest. But on the Day of Atonement, he took off those garments of splendor and beauty. And he just wore a simple linen robe. A simple linen garment was what he wore. There were a few other small details as to what he wore. But his basic garment of clothing, he looked like anyone else. If you knew who he was, that you could, is that the high priest? He, he looks so different. He, he's not wearing his garments of beauty and glory. He, he just looks like everybody else. And he officiated these. A goat was taken, two goats actually, and the high priest would uh, having taken off his garments of beauty and glory, he would lay his hands on the head of the goat and he would confess all the sins that were possible to commit. And people gathered around could hear their sin being confessed and it was being laid upon the head of the goat. There are other details in here, but and you're welcome to read it. But eventually, the goat was slain and the blood was taken by the high priest and presented before the Lord. It was the, one of the holiest days of the year in the nation of Israel. And when the whole thing was done and the, and the blood was accepted in the presence of God, the high priest would then put back on his garments of glory and beauty. And the resurrection, in a sense, is the answer to that in the New Testament because Jesus, when he came at his incarnation, did not look like the king of heaven. He, In a sense, he had taken off his garments of splendor and beauty that he had in heaven that set him apart as God. God the Son, and he looked like anybody else. He just looked like a normal person. And he came to officiate a sacrifice, the shedding of his own blood for the forgiveness of our sins. What kind of love is that? You know, when someone sins against you, you probably get mad at them. When someone sins against you, you'd probably take revenge if you possibly could. But the King of Heaven won those who offended him, won those who sinned against him by taking the guilt that they had incurred and dying with it upon the cross. What kind of strategy is that? You know, you won't hear that at West Point. When you're in a battle, die for the enemy, you know. <laughs> you, you, that's a strategy that only God could come up with. Because Jesus took our place and the high priest set aside his garments of beauty and glory in the, in the incarnation. And he came to offer a sacrifice on Passover that was, that was the blood was taken before the Father in the, the heavenly holy of holies and accepted God accepted Christ's sacrifice. And then the resurrection in a way is that high priest putting back on his garments of glory and beauty to go back into heaven, to take his place that he had ever enjoyed before there was a world, before there were people, before there was sin. 
at the right hand of the Father. And he did this. The word became flesh, John 1, 14 and 15, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That was our Jesus. And this Jesus, as he approaches his death at Passover, he, he calmly is declaring that he's gonna rise again from the dead the third day by his own power. Matthew 16, 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised up on the third day. Same gospel, Matthew 17, 23. He's saying again, they will kill him, speaking of himself. He will be raised on the third day. They were deeply grieved. And look how specific this is in Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. It could not be more more specific, he understood exactly what was going to take place to him, and he knew that it had to happen for the forgiveness of our sins, and he was willing to do it. He saw the whole thing. You know, when he was on that cross, the soldiers mocked him. They would hit him, and they'd say, prophesy to us, Christ. Who hit you? Do you know he could have? The Bible says, knowing all things that were before him, he, he went out to that cross. He knew the whole picture. He could have called them by name had he chosen to. But, you know, I, I've learned along the way something. It's better off not to answer some people. <laughs> you learned that along the way? Sometimes it's better off just don't say a word. Just let it go. And, uh, you know, he did this. John chapter 10, 17 to 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So Christ is ready to go to the cross to the high priest is ready to offer himself as the sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, that we could be forgiven. Before the crown came the cross. And I would like, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 53, because this was written hundreds of years before Christ went to the cross. Hundreds of years prophesied, Isaiah chapter 53. You could actually begin in Isaiah 52 in the last two verses, but for our purposes here today, we're gonna to read Isaiah 53. And by the way, this is Isaiah at the end of his life, nearing the end of his life. He began his calling when he saw the Lord high and lifted up with his train filling the temple in Isaiah chapter six. six. And he said, uh, uh, Lord, you know, uh, here am I, send me. And God said, you know, I'm going to send you to a people who aren't going to listen. I'm going to send you to a people who aren't going to hear. Their, their hearts are going to be hard, and they're not going to understand. And he said, how long? <laughs> I like that. I can relate to that. God sending you to a hard people. Not, not here. But, you know, if God was sending me to hard people, I'd be like, how long, you know, too. But here at the end of his life, he, he says this, Lord, who has believed our message? For all those years, he's been talking not only about Christ, but underlying it all about the Savior who would come. Who has believed our message? And to who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. That word root out of parched ground in the Hebrew, it's the word netzer which may not mean a lot to you, but it's the same root in Greek as, as Nazarene. He grew up before him as a tender shoot, as a netzer. And in the New Testament, it takes that and it says about, he shall be called a Nazarene. That's where most likely this comes from. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. 
He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. This was before crucifixion had ever been thought of. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All these details were written in public documents centuries. And we think God, if God hasn't answered us in two weeks, we think, not going to happen, you know. <laughs> Maybe we need to learn a little bit of patience and to learn how God does things. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. I love the way the King James translates that. The King James puts it, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Just like the high priest on the day of atonement laid his hands upon the goat and confessed all the sins that could be possibly committed in the nation of Israel. And how many of you know there's probably a few more that have been added to that list since those days and the days in which we live. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Pilate said to him, why don't you answer me? Don't you know that I have the power to release you? But actually, Jesus was in charge. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, the Passover, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? In his generation, they mocked him as he died. No one considered that the horrible death that he was experiencing was because of the transgression of the people who really should have been the ones to suffer. His grave was assigned with the wicked, yet with the rich man in his death. And if you remember back in the New Testament, this was literally true. They, they were going to give him a common grave where the criminals were buried who couldn't afford to buy a, a grave. But a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, stepped in, and it wasn't because he read Isaiah 53 that he did it. He just did it, in, and he didn't even know he was fulfilling these prophecies. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but yet with a rich man in his death. I wonder what Joseph of Arimathea thought when he realized that his actions had been foretold before hundreds of years before it ever happened. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. And now, after talking about this death, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many." and interceded for the transgressors. That's our Jesus. I mean, how much did God put in to the events of this week? Hundreds of years before it ever happened, before crucifixion had ever been thought of or invented. These things were written. It's like a little movie of the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus written hundreds of years in public documents before they ever came to pass. I want to tell you this is important to God, and it's important to God because it has to do with the eternity of people. And what we do with Jesus Christ makes all the difference for where we spend eternity. All the difference. He will prolong his days. He will come back from the dead. 
Isn't that wonderful? He defied from the first human to the last human. There's only one who by his own power and ability with no external help came back from the dead and never died again. So far, so far, <laughs> so far. He did that. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. And our lives are in his hands. And do you know when Jesus went to the cross, do you remember they divided, they cast lots for his garments. But there was one garment that they didn't want to tear up and distribute. They, they cast lots for one specific thing. Anybody remember what that was? It was a linen garment. A linen garment. In other words, Jesus wore to the cross what the high priest wore on the Day of Atonement to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people that would bring the blood of that sacrifice to be accepted before God, that his wrath could be satisfied, that his justice could be satisfied, that forgiveness could be released. That's what Jesus wore to the cross. But it didn't end there. He came back from the dead. He rose again. Death could not hold him. Crucified on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, came back to life on first fruits. And he is the first fruits of those who've been resurrected. People, it says in the Bible, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My mom and my dad are absent from their body and they're present with the Lord. But one day, one day, something's going to happen where our bodies are raised again from the dead and we're reunited with them in a permanent, eternal fashion. We don't really know what that's going to mean or what that's going to look like or anything like that. Some people say, I hope in my resurrected body, whenever that happens, I look like I'm 24. <laughs> We probably look better than we looked at 24, you know? <laughs> but he came alive. John chapter 20, verses 6 through 8. Simon Peter came also, speaking of the tomb, following him, entered the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappers, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who came first to the tomb then also entered. He saw and believed. These grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped with, they were stiff. They were like mummy cloths, that kind of a thing. But when Jesus rose from the dead, the part that covered his face in John's gospel was taken and set aside, rolled up. Because the, apparently, the, if I understand this correctly, uh, the form that was there of those other grave wrappings were still in the form of a human body. And he saw the form that those linens lying in their folds, it literally says, with the face cloth off to the side. In other words, Jesus needed no more help getting out of the grave clothes than he needed getting out of the grave. When he came back to life, he just went out of both of them. And he was risen. And the angel didn't come and roll away the stone to let him out. I love it says, first of all, there's all these guards. There's all the authority of Rome there at the tomb. This stone would take eight men to roll away. Eight men to roll in place. Roman soldiers are there to make sure nothing happens to this body. And this angel comes down from heaven. There's an earthquake. He rolls away the stone and he sits on it. I love that. It's like, I own this. <laughs> I own this symbol of the death of Jesus. I own it. It's mine. And they became like dead men. Boom, they fell on the ground. 
He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said time and time and time again, he said. You know what the interest, the amazing thing is, and actually I can relate to this. I, I can actually relate to this. His disciples forgot that he said that. But one person didn't. The chief priest. You know, the disciples actually forgot. They, they had to be reminded that he had said he was going to rise again. And in all the chaos that can take place in our life, all the problems, sometimes we forget that he's alive. Our minds can't multi-track all the time. We don't always retain the thought in our mind that he's alive. We have to remind ourselves that he's alive. But the truth of the matter is, he's alive. That's the truth of the matter. He is alive. And whatever problems you face in your life, health problems, financial problems, family problems, relationship problems, whatever kind of problems you face in your life, there's a living Savior who has his hand upon you. And you've got to have confidence to move forward in your life and to trust him. Now, you can look at all the problems and all the reasons in the world that you think God might not come through, or you can look at the empty tomb and you can know He will come through. And that's what I choose to do. Sometimes it takes me a little while to get there. Sometimes I'm looking at the problems and they're pretty big and I'm overwhelmed, but I get back to where I'm looking at the empty tomb and I'm believing that there's a risen Lord who somehow in his mercy and his grace loves me for reasons I don't even understand, who calls me to trust him, and I do. Does trusting him mean that you have all the answers? No, it doesn't mean you all have all the answers, but it, knows, it means that you know he has all the answers. He has all the answers. Because he's alive. And death could not hold him. It says in the book of Acts that it was impossible that he could be held in its grasp. It was not even remotely possible that he could stay dead because of who he is. He looked, he looked like anyone else on that day of atonement. We called him Jesus. Jesus is the name of his humiliation. When he put on coveralls and came to do the dirty work of saving this world from its sins, we called him Jesus. And don't you love that name? But the name of his exaltation, when he put back on those garments of glory and splendor, is Lord. And God has made him, this risen Jesus, both Lord and Christ. He said in John's gospel, when he prayed as he was going to the cross, he prayed and he said to them, John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, which the glory I had with you ever before the world was. In other words, God, I'm coming back. I'm putting back on my garments of glory and beauty. And glorify thou me together with yourself, which the glory that I ever shared with you before the world was from before there was time. He's our Lord. He is exalted. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says this, For I delivered as to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's of first importance. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says this, He, Jesus, died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. How are we doing with that? It's easier said than done, isn't it? Not living any longer for ourselves, but living for him. 
it's a lot easier to say it than it is to do it. How are we doing with that? You know, uh, let, let's give ourselves a little chuck up. He died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Are we living for Jesus? Romans 14, 9, to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You know, he, he wants to to be in charge of our lives. He wants to guide us and lead us, and he wants us to, to live a life that brings glory and honor to him. To this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. And I'm glad we live in a day and a time where we can voluntarily give our lives to Jesus because the day is coming when involuntarily every knee is gonna bow one day and every tongue is gonna confess. It may be too late for some, but every knee is still gonna bow and every tongue is still gonna confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's gonna happen. But in this day and age, we voluntarily give our lives to Jesus because we understand and we see what he has done for us. He took my place. I'm going to ask Ed to come back up to the front. He took our place. I had a friend when we lived in England. I've told the story before, but it states it. He used to say to people, if you were standing trial for a crime that you committed and the penalty was death and you were ready to hear the final judgment from the judge and the judge stated to you, you are guilty of the crime that you were charged with and you knew you were and the penalty is death. However, if you're willing, I will take your place and you can go free. Who in their right mind would say, maybe when I'm older or I have to think about that or there's too much to give up or, or how about my Lord and my God? How about that? How about, Jesus, this is unbelievable that you would do this for me. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. I, I give my life to you because I see a little bit of what you've done for me. You died and rose again to forgive me of my sins and to make me part of your family. And I'm ready to take my place. So I just want everyone to close your eyes and bow your head for a moment. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is your best opportunity to do that. Here in his presence, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I've done things that I shouldn't have done. But I thank you that you did something you did not have to do. You died on the cross to forgive me of all my sins, to make me your child. Forgive me, Lord. I ask you to wash me and cleanse me of my sins. And I give my life to you today. Jesus, I accept what you have done for me. I thank you for it. I give my life to you, and I thank you that you're alive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, I, I want you to, to tell someone whose Christianity you admire that you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus Christ into your life. We're gonna pray another prayer for those who Maybe the scripture, he died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. Maybe we're not doing real well with that, some of us. We're gonna have another prayer. And for all of us in this room who maybe we're not living for him like we should, we're, we're gonna pray too. So I just want you to close your eyes and pray with me. Dear Lord God, forgive me for wandering. 
why would I wander from the source of eternal life? Forgive me, Lord. I want to get close to you again. I, I want to live for you. I want to give my whole life for you, Lord. And I want out of my life all the things that are not consistent with Christians and Christianity and the Bible. Forgive me, Lord. Help me to redo my priorities that I could live for you every day of my life and enjoy your presence. Lord, I thank you that you accept me. In Jesus' name I pray. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you. Hello.